Hello, everyone. I'm Dmitry Berlinski, professor of violin here at the MSU College of Music. And I would like to welcome all of you to Dorothy Delay Masterclass Series. It's really exciting to hear, to, to see you all here. It's the first time we're doing a live event. And of course, it was very long anticipated since last year. We had many online sessions, actually 18 sessions online. And it's only today where we are welcoming live audience here at the Cook Recital Hall and also on live stream. So it's delightful to have a good start of the year with fantastic young cellist joining us today, Zlatomir Fang. He's a winner of the last Tchaikovsky competition and many, many others. And we have two MSU students of Professor Bagratuni performing for Zlatomir. And Professor Bagratuni is here. We're going to have some conversation, uh, I, I guess, after the first student. So we'll have some time to talk. If you have questions, you can think about those questions and ask us during the conversation or later at the Q&A session. There is a mic, it's better to speak to the mic, so online audience will be able to hear us. So um, I'm, I'm really, really grateful to uh, many former um, Dorothy Delay students because with their encouragement and participation in the last year online series, it's been possible to continue and hopefully we'll have a good season. We have upcoming artists as Midori coming in October and uh, among others, Vadim Glusman and Rohan de Silva. So um, it's really very exciting to, to start the season and to have wonderful opportunity to reconnect with faculty, with colleagues, with students and with the broader audience. Hopefully they're watching us now and um, I'm really, really delightful to invite on the stage Latamir Fang. So I just would like to announce that we have Zhang Zhang and Gloria Yang performing Prokofiev Cello Sonata, first moment, Andante Grave. Please welcome.
Fantastic, beautiful, um, is this working? Yes, okay. Uh, beautiful, emotional, heartfelt performance. Um, thank you both so much, that was really great. And uh, um, I think you work really well together uh, as musicians and there's like a sense of um, trust and connection between you two, so it's great. Yeah, it's really fantastic. Um, I think that uh, we could talk maybe about just a couple things. Um, you know, certain ideas that I have about the piece that you might be interested in. Um, one of them is, is sort of a general thing that's more chillistic. And then another one is, is sort of a more abstract thing, which it has to do with, you know, the, the connections between the different sections. I think, as you, as you probably know, the, the, I think the, the biggest challenge of this, of this piece is the fact that, you know, you have all these disparate sections uh, that have different different, very different characters, um, and there needs to be a, some sort of coherent relationship between all of them, right? Um, I think the biggest challenge actually is, is the, the transition between the first topic material stuff at the beginning and the, the, the second theme, if you will, the ya da 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 right? I'm sure you, you felt that when you work um, on the piece. Um, I would say that I think one of the things that might be helpful for you to, in terms of framing that relationship, is you, you know you think about the fact that this piece is in is in is in three, right? And three is a very interesting meter, you know, um, because it has so many different possibilities, and it's a very flexible meter in terms of what it can express. And I think that um, in the beginning, it's more like this kind of holy three, you know, like the holy trinity, something very eternal and elemental uh, and then by the time we get to the second theme it's more of the dancing three and you know so I think you can you can try to find more more difference between the the sense of the pulse uh, at the beginning and in the beginning material and then the sense of the pulse in you know when you have the ya da 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 it's very dancing right um, and of course then the challenge is to find a way to you have to find the perfect tempo that can express both of those things and be the same in, in absolute terms, right? But of course, it's very different. It feels very different, right? Um, okay, so why don't, we, uh, why don't we start at the beginning a little bit? And um, as I was saying, I, I kind of see the beginning, uh, you know, it's so interesting that there's no dynamic marking, right? It's just full voice, plena voce. I have a question about Sure. Well, I, I think it's a really big question. You know, I, I only have my own ideas, but I'm sure there are many different ways to do it. The way that I see it, and I feel like this is, this would, would not uh, contradict what you're already trying to do, which has a lot already in it. Um, I see it as kind of like uh, uh, something very, um, so, something in nature, like, um, like a, a glacier moving, right? 
And the thing about it is that the, the, the speed at which something like that happens can actually objectively, objectively be very fast, but it can seem very slow because the size of what's happening is very big, right? And I think that's kind of, for me, that, that, that's the hook for this beginning, is you have to think about a tempo that has a lot of forward motion, but doesn't feel, it doesn't feel fast. It has to feel extremely drawn out and expansive. Um, so more to your question, I think that the, the it's, it's kind of neither. It's neither expressive nor quiet. It's very present, but it's also objective, you know? It's just like nature, you know, nature doesn't, they don't, it, it, they don't feel, like the, the trees don't feel the same way we do, right? They have this kind of majesty to them in their existence. And I think that that's, um, that's I think, what, you, what we could try to go for here. Um, so, uh, just specifically, at the beginning, I think one of the things that will help you um, avoid, avoid the sense of too many impulses is just really working on your sense of sostenuto. And this is also a general theme throughout the piece. Uh, I think that, um, you know, it's funny because when we, when we learn how to play the cello, when we draw an open string, it's, it's just, you know, once we master that, it's really normal for us and our bow is just like, we can see the balance of our bow as we draw it. And then suddenly when we add in fingers, we have all these pulsations, right? Why? Well, because both hands, you know, it's just human nature for both hands to want to do the same thing. But in my opinion, mastery of the cello and any string instrument is the ability to disconnect the roles of the two hands, right? So you want to really try to feel the, the sustaining quality in the right hand, even if you're articulating strongly in the left, right? Um, okay, why don't you try the beginning again? Good. Sorry to stop you already. Yeah, that was better. That was better already. I want you to try an experiment. I want you to try to play it in, in uh, as many notes in one bow as possible. So kind of like, it doesn't have to be full dynamic. Something like that. <laughs> Nice. So actually, this kind of thing is instructive because it should tell you the tempo that you need. And the, the note that will give it away is the G. Because if you're doing one bow and you're in too slow of a tempo and you're trying to save your bow, the G will die. The note itself will die. It will have no meaning, right? So if you find the, a tempo where you can continue something and then, of course, you have the articulations, but that's just the way that you, you find that sense, again, that the, the, the phrase is endless, right? That there are no bow changes, but just um, continual sound, just nature, right? Along those same lines, if you are going to do the bowing you're doing, I'd be very careful that, that you really feel that fifth that you sustain through the bow change. I mean, personally, I do, I do an up bow because I find it easier to feel that exact thing. But it's fine to do what you're doing, just make sure to, to sustain. Yeah. Okay, sorry to stop, we'll, we'll go on now. Yeah. Okay, good, nice, nice, many good things. So yeah, first of all, don't worry, you know, I know it's very easy like, when you're thinking, it's just like very tense, and try to always remember to come back to the breath. If you can just, if you can breathe normally and naturally, then 
the music will flow out of you. Um, one thing to keep in mind when the piano enters is that, at least for the first several, several bars, there's this feature where, you know, whenever the piano stops on a note or a harmony, you fill in the gap and likewise, right? So whenever you, uh, da, da, di, the piano is, so in, uh, in my experience, something that's helpful to think about is, is imagine that you're playing your partner's your partner's role, right? Even though you're, of course, just holding a note, here are all the notes that, that the piano's playing within the G that you're playing. And that will also help you link them together because you don't want to, when the piano enters, ya da da da, you should feel ya di da da di da da. It's an endless phrase again, yeah. Um, and um, anyway, that was, that was good. Uh, just one small thing about the poco crescendo bar. When you get here, this note, because it's the beginning of the crescendo, I would draw it out more so than the others. You, you kind of, you allowed the sustenuto quality to die a little bit, but uh, I would feel how it's becoming more chromatic. And then here, this is, the counterpoint becomes denser because now the piano is interrupting you. They're not just filling in the gap. So there, especially that bar, I would really crescendo to the mezzo forte. Yeah, I think that there's something very linear about the way that the dynamics here work, that it's, it's not like you know, moving in humps, it's really just ascending, like moving, yeah, like nature. Like, yeah. um, anyway, that was very good. Why don't we go to um, big number one? Do you have... Uh, uh, and here, you know, I, I th this is like a, this is an effect, right? It's not, um, it's not a technical thing. Personally, I like using more bow, like you just kind of... You, it should be, I, I think it should be like a shiver, kind of, you know, in the winter. So, um, but anyway, it's just my opinion. Um, um, let's go from actually two bars before that. That's a forte. Uh, the big one? Oh, uh, two bars before that, maybe? Oh. The, the low D? Nice, very good, very good. Um, so this is another opportunity, by the way, in this part to like, if you got a little slow at the beginning, now you can pick up the tempo, you know, just because it feels natural, the, the rhythm is becoming quicker. Um, when you hear, play here in the forte, you know, the register is, is not ideal for the cello, obviously. You know, Prokofiev, he was, I think, really good at understanding balance, and it does work. Um, so I think you just need to go a little closer to the bridge to get the forte you want. Remember that it's, it's a, now it's a, actually a different dynamic from the beginning. I mean, the beginning is you can you know, be more subtle about the fact that it's quote unquote loud, but here it actually is quite strong. So uh, I would search for a really full, full sound. And also when you get to the C sharp um, here, again, play the piano part. Right? So don't don't diminuendo because the, the, the piano's phrase is not a it's not a diminuendo. In fact, if anything, it, it, it grows into the next into the next bar, which happens to be a rest, right? Um, okay, try one more time. Push a little closer to the bridge and the C sharp there. Yeah.
Okay, nice. Very good. Very good. Better, better. Uh, when you get to the pizzicato, um, I would definitely try to play closer to the rosin. It's kind of... Because here, it's too thin. Also, you might end up hitting the, the fingerboard. And when you get to the, the uh, here, I would vibrate a lot. Um, next, in the next rhythm, be careful again that the, the quintuplet is, is precise because, I mean, again, if it were a more improvisatory type of motive, then it might be okay to mess around a little bit. But I think here, you know, the piano is just playing straight eight, so, sorry. Really, uh, feel the, the two against uh, five there. Um, and it was good the way you sustained uh, here. When you get to the A flat for the first time, feel the change of harmony in the piano. And uh, yeah, I think it can just be a little richer, you know. There, there are more notes suddenly. In the left hand, there are octaves uh, before it was just single notes. Um, okay, let's just go from there, actually, that bar of the and da 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 dee in, um, in rhythm. Yeah. Change the color for a forte, closer to the bridge. Nice. Sustain. Okay, good, 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 yeah. So this section is, it's a little bit of a challenge, I think, for the balance. I would say that, especially the first part, when it's mezzo forte still, it can be, I think, a little thinner in the texture, just like, I would say more articulation, less, less sound, maybe. Because the cello, it, it's nice because the cello can really sing, and then you bring the harmony, but in a transparent way. I would say that that that, uh, that might help. Um, but in terms of um, in terms of the cello part, I think it's important again to really feel the here. If you are going to do that fingering. Uh, Connections, these small connections. If you die, then you lose the sense that that the, the phrase is continuing. These very, these are all very long phrases. You see it in the Boeings. You know, it's just like we wanted something really expansive. Um, and and in these rhythms, uh, always be searching kind of for a way to transform your sound in the middle of the note. I think in in general, you know, you have a really um, you have a really fantastic sensitivity to the beginning of, of the notes in, in, this, in this section. But you can kind of focus more on the middle and the end, the way that the things evolve, the way that the notes change and respond to, to the, the ones that come before and after them. Um, that will just bring more content to, to, the, to, the, to what's happening in the music. Um, and you know, the way, in terms of how, how I would practice this section, I think it's really important to think about the relationships between things and place them really close together, even though, of course, you know, when you play it for an audience or play it in a, in a concert, it's, it's never going to be the case that, like, oh, they're going to they're gonna know that this one was a forte and this one was a mezzo forte. But you should know. So, you know, you should know that this is... That's a mezzo forte, and then this... would be more of a forte quality, right? Um, and same thing when you have... Uh, compared to... Uh, 
the second time when it's when it's a when it goes on to a different different character. Um, so yeah, I, I find it really helpful when I practice to just like take one bar that has a particular function and then pair it with the corresponding one, with the mirroring one, and figure out what the difference is, what you need to specifically do. Um, yeah, okay, so when we get to, to big number four, this is where I think you have to let go a little bit in terms of the, the physicality of, of the music because th now it really, you can really start to feel the way that the three, four, has evolved into this kind of this dance where it's very clear that there's a lot of upward motion, right? If before everything was moving kind of horizontally, now there's a lot of energy that's lifting you, right? Even though it's forte, it's very animated. Uh, do you want to try um, four bars before that? So the mezzo forte, right there. Sustain. Crescendo. Nice, good, good. Um, so I thought that was pretty successful, um, but when you got to the piano, to me it felt, um, well, there, I had two reactions. One was that it felt like it was a very similar dynamic to the, to the mezzo forte, and the other is that it felt very, um, uh, very thin. And I, I think that when you're working on the dynamics, I would think more in terms of the, um, the texture, like, you think about um, piano more as something being very soft, like if you were touching like a nice cat or something, right? Um, it's soft in its ethos, but it still has a lot of internal emotional quality and struggle, right? Something that's mezzo forte or forte, it has that kind of that openness, that strength. And, and I, I would say that you know, this passage is one of the trickiest ones because it's a very quick transition from forte to piano. And I, would, I think you should really challenge yourself to do it without any time. I think if you can make the diminuendo happen in a simple way, it will be very powerful. Also because you've taken the audience now along in this journey with the new sense of pulse in this, this really dance-like 3-4. And you don't want to take them away from that right, right as you've gotten to the climax in the forte, right? Um, Okay, so you can uh, think about that. Sorry, we're moving along quickly, but it's such a long movement, you know. Um, okay, this was very good. Why don't we go to five? Here at five, I thought um, something a little more shimmering, like um, vulnerable, vulnerable in the sound uh, on the B. And again, here, play the piano part when, uh, just play, play, play with me once uh, from five. If, Bombi. You, you can hear the, the, the way that the sound changes between the moment when it's when the harmony comes in, it fills in the sound, right? Thank you. Um, all right, yes, uh, why don't you try right there? Nice. Okay, beautiful. Excellent. That was much better. So in the next section, this is a really interesting section. I think that the, the way you played it was great, but I could have used, it, um, I could, I could have used a little more brutality in, in the sound. Um, I think that it's intentionally a bit dumb. 
the music and the music is written. It's kind of a, I think it's a, it's a, a type of it's a, a kind of a parody of, um, you know, maybe like incompetent bureaucracy or something like that. Um, I, what, what I was thinking while you're playing it, it's like, oh, it's a bunch of foolish um, military leaders planning an invasion, and then by the time they get here, they realize they have to like stop all their horses because it's too cold, right? <laughs> and um, so, uh, yeah, the, here I would, uh, I would kind of, I wouldn't be afraid to be a little ugly and, and brutal with it. Because it's all about contrast, right? If you play really strong and kind of nastily there, then when you get to... You can be poetic and beautiful if you want, right? Want to try from it there? Yeah. So, um, uh, my, again, this is just my opinion, but I think that when you get to uh, the bar two before seven, the writ bar, I know it's kind of traditional to do it the way that you're doing. Personally, I think it's, it's, um, it's too slow, and also it's, the writ is too soon. I remember I was once, um, um, someone else was playing this for me, and I, I pulled out the metronome, and I was like, okay, you're starting at 100, and it turned out they had like, gone all the way down to like 70. Or something, but it's only poco meno mosa. I think it should be maybe 84, 86, like minimum. Uh, so, um, and again, in terms of the, the, the way that you're experiencing the pulse, that's kind of the, I think, the tempo you should get to. It's, it's, it's really still quite fast, I think. He could have written tempo one, but he didn't, right? So it's a very different, it's a very different presentation of the main theme. All right, so um, just do the same thing again. And yeah, in that writ bar, try not to do it so uh, immediately. Yom, bom, 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 bom. Pull back and don't pull back too much. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, good. Yeah, very good. Just uh, in, uh, these long notes, I, I know it's very difficult to, with the projection, but uh, try to save as much bow as possible for the end, because again, the end is the most expressive part when you shift, right? Shift to the next note. Still, I think you guys are too slow because yom. Yeah, if you. Dum, bum, bum, bum. It's actually, I think, pretty fast. It's only poco metal mosso, so. But anyway, you can, you can think about it. Um, uh, you want to go on to eight? eight. Okay. Brutal. Think brutal. In da, 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 da. Don't be afraid to scratch. <laughs> okay. Very good, but I, I just, you were playing practically at the fingerboard. <laughs> uh, play really da -da 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 -da, strong near, near, the, uh, near the bridge. Yeah. You don't have to use so much bow, it's just dense, dense sound. That's the only way you're going to project through the piano. You try one more time, yeah.
Good. Okay, very good. A couple things. One is that I would let the piano finish this kind of improvisatory thing before you enter. It's very, it's very, um, it, it's it's very free. It's suddenly like kind of a cadenza, right? So yada, yada. hear that E resonate, and then <laughs> then join, right? S uh, similarly, with to the beginning, I would practice this. Uh, <laughs> lot of slurs because it, right now it feels a little disjointed you create that illusion again that it's something very elemental something that's coming from the earth uh, uh, and the long note I know it's hard but sustain save the bow because the most exciting part is the end when something is about to happen and then it finally does right it's um you know it's it's a lot like uh, you know, when, when you tell a joke to someone, the best part is the part right before the punchline, when you're like waiting to hear what's going to happen, right? That's the same kind of principle. It's like the dramatic principle that um, the, right before the change happens, that's, that's when it's most exciting. That's when you have to be the most present in what you're doing. Uh, okay, let's, um, yeah, let's try one more time. Yeah, that's an important passage. So yeah, just wait once the E comes. Yeah. And also physically change, be more majestic, be sit up a little straighter. It's it's dramatic. You're an actor here. Okay, good, very good. Sorry, I stopped you. Um, this is very good overall. Um, just remember the mezzo piano, it's still a very, very expressive dynamic. Even though it might be soft, uh, there's still a lot inside. And I think this pa whole passage until the pits should feel like a little bit like being lost in the woods. And you know, if you're lost in the woods, it might feel to you like time has stopped, but time is going on at the same time the same speed, right? So again, don't get slow. Feel, feel that the tempo is just right there because when you get to hear, you need to relate. Again, the dance quality is back. It's the nature versus humanity, right? Um, try from, yeah, the mezzo piano. One more time. Feel the internal drive of the pulse. Uh, from here. Yeah, 106, exactly. Don't get slow. Yeah, very good. This is all really nice. Um, just to repeat some st stuff. Piano, mezzo, piano. In this case, I think 
It just means more volatility. This is um, more settled and uh, there's something happening. And the forte, again, I think it felt too similar in terms of the content of your sound to the piano. You're gonna really try to find a, this real strength and then the real vulnerability. Um, yeah. So again, it's, it, the dynamic is not so much about the, the absolute volume. But that's why I think it's so important for you to experiment more with going closer to the bridge. Because when you go closer to the bridge, you can get that, that uh, bite, that kind of uh, projective core that will make something sound like it has more content, which is what you want. More body to it, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, let's go on though. Um, this next passage is very interesting. Same thing, uh, I would practice. It will, I think it will be really fun for you to, to practice that way. Challenge yourself, like, you know, one, it's like lifting weights. You know, one day you can make, uh, you can put 15 notes in a bow, the next day you can put 16, the next day 17. Eventually you can play the whole passage in one bow. <laughs> um, but yeah, now in this place, what do you feel the character is? I mean, it's very interesting. It's mezzo forte espressivo, right? What, what, do you, what would you say, like, what is it? Mm. You know, actually, that's, that's interesting because it, it, I think it is a big surprise for the audience when they get to this spot because it feels like the beginning of a completely new section because it's quite, it's quite something quite different from everything else. But then suddenly it's like we're back at the beginning, right, very, very soon. So yeah, you're, I think it does have an introductory quality, but it has to be kind of, it has to evolve into something as, it, as you go on into, into something like, oh, we're coming... We're, we're, we're a little bit like we're, we're walking through through the woods, but we've come to something that we recognize, right? Um, I have a question. Uh, do I need to say that you need to jump more? You know, I think this is one of the few places where you could be a little free, actually. Like, because as Percivo, you know, that has so many different meanings, obviously. I mean, most people, well, myself included, the, most of the time when we see as Percivo, we just want to vibrate more. That basically just means that. Uh, a little more juice in the sound, but again, it's such a strange passage in, in the context of the piece that I think you can afford to find tenutos here and there and kind of, if a note really speaks to you, draw it out. On the condition, of course, that when you get back to the, the grave, come prima, that you really just, again, completely timeless, it just moves forward. No influence of your playing on the pulse. It should just exist and you should fit right into it. Okay, let's just try this passage once. Uh, again, search for a sound that has a lot of content, deep. Good, very good. That was overall really good. Just one, one thing uh, here, here, over the bar lines. I think it's so much. It's more important than ever to sustain, to, to, to really, because that that's what will make it feel like the phrase is continuing. At the end, uh, bomb. Be aware that you know whatever you do, timing wise. It should be conductible. I think this is really important when it comes to like writs. Like it should be something that an orchestra could follow. Yada ti. Right? So make it logical. Make it still within three, four. Of course you can be free, but make it have it make sense to you. It should make sense to you and to the audience. Okay, um, why don't we skip to the coda? Um, yeah. How about number 17? <laughs> Here, this tempo 
What, what's interesting is that this tempo is meno moso, right? It, also in your part? I, know some, I think the, the edition I'm looking at has some misprints, but uh, it should be a little bit slower than the poco meno moso from the... So if you want to do... Uh, then what you do in that other section has to be a little bit faster than this. So just, again, think about the, the, the relationships between that. Yeah. Um, okay, let's take it. Time. Yeah, drummer. This, all this, uh, like, like really in the rosin. By the time you finish this movement, you should, your whole thumb should be covered in rosin. <laughs> um, also, uh, faster. I would go faster, and I wouldn't actually, I wouldn't mind if you took two bows. I think you could do, or, or something. I don't know because it's, it just needs a lot of energy. It needs power, and if you kind of are worried about saving bow. You, you, you already lost, you lost the power, right? You can experiment with that. Um, okay, let's try one more time. And Pitts is really go for it. Project to the back of the hall. Okay, nice, nice, great. Sorry, I stopped you before the end. Um, very good. I think you just need to practice like almost Ponticello and then bring it back because uh, if you really practice it, you need to get comfortable playing really close to the bridge and uh, then eventually you'll start to enjoy it. It's kind of funny. It's like, uh, it's an acquired taste, but uh, <laughs> it pays off. Um, yeah, and um, you know, think, this is a moment I think where you really have to think orchestrally so again, think that the, the pits is, you're like speaking for an entire section of the orchestra. Like imagine that you're an entire cello section playing the pits' divisi, how big it would sound, right? That's, how, that's what I think you need to go for. Now when you get here, again, same thing, closer to the bridge. And also be careful that you control the slur, because I think that's the, the moment where it can kind of fly off the rails a little bit. Uh, you make it compact. And then, of course, once you have the control of it, then you can broaden it out a little bit, use a little more bow. Now, kind of the last thing I wanted to mention was, you know, at the beginning, uh, sorry, at the, sorry, not the beginning, um, at the end of this yum, da 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 dum, you, you've dropped from fortissimo to forte, right? And the, the energy is dissipating. But for my taste, the way that you played it, it just suddenly kind of disappears too much. You know, you have all this intensity that's been building up throughout, throughout the entire piece. It has to, the, the way that it, it, it um, dissipates has to be more, more gradual. And in fact, what I, what I like to do, I, again, I don't know if this is a misprint, but I personally like to do it. In your part, it's forte all the way until the piano. So actually, <laughs> piano, play, yadi, I would sustain forte, and now, and then suddenly it's like you walk into um, a Christmas store and you see all the the the, the snow globes. It's uh, that, that's what I imagine there. Um, yeah, sure.
Uh, I think it has a lot to do with the first note. So you have, and then, and then, those, those, and then feel that the color of those first notes when the chord changes are different. You can use vibrato, you can use bow speed, pressure to vary them. And then that will set the tone for the next bar, the next two bars, yeah. Yeah, actually, that's a, it's smart that you mentioned that because that's one way that you can practice the diminuendo is that you have, and then, yeah. And, have, and then, uh, uh, so you can really feel the harmonic progression down to that D, right? It's quite beautiful, actually. Okay, just try one more time and really hold that D. Let the piano diminuendo from the mezzo forte, and again, hear the beauty sort of of that melody, but hold on to the, to the D uh, until, the, until the, the downbeat of, ni of num 19. All right, you want to try one more time right from 18? From 18? Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, met with Professor Bogresuni during the Tchaikovsky competition in, in 1986. It's been around 35 years or so. <laughs> and it's interesting because you, you, you were, were there the last winner of the competition. And it's, uh, it's still considered to be one of the most important competition. It's quite different when we performed 35 years ago. There was no internet, no YouTube. Yes, but the, but the music was more or less the same <laughs> at that time. And the preparation, the, the, the anxiety for all contestants, I, I'm sure it stays the same. It doesn't, doesn't go away. So my question, I think many people would be interested to know, do you have a, a special uh, way to prepare for the competition or for the concert mentally? And uh, of course, Mr. Bogartoni can share some, some of his thoughts on this matter, I'm sure. Well, how, you prepare, how did you prepare for competition? You, you went to the special place, right? You told me once. You want to talk to me about it? Well, they sent us to uh, summer houses of the Bolshoi Theater so we could prepare in separate cottages to practice and stuff like that. I remember it was pretty uh, impressive team because Maria Gulegin was there, Levon Muradian, all those winners of that next competition. And it was a great stuff, but it was only three weeks. And we were uh, driving or taking a bus back to Moscow to get our lessons from the professor. I remember one lesson was after Professor Shachovskaya's concert when she played Schumann Concerto in the hall. We didn't have time. So she said, just stay after my concert. I'll listen to your program. And uh, that was pretty interesting, very intense uh, 
preparation, professor was drilling you all the time, and then just before you go to play, she comes to you and said, forget everything I told you, just go and play, have fun. Very nice. Uh, but yeah, it was kind of ner nerve wracking because of the, not the favorite hall to play in Tchaikovsky Hall, not the conservatory. And uh, you know, you never know, you project enough or people and jury is sitting right there, right in front of you. And then, you know, Daniel Shafran with his thing, as always. But it was very memorable, of course. It's 35 years past, but I remember every day of sure. it. And it yeah. was a very important step, especially it for was. Us, yeah. us from the Soviet Union. Yeah, the yeah. and you know, you have, you have responsibility not to screw up because your country is behind you. <laughs> Yeah, so this kind of stuff. Ah, so you, you, before Tchaikovsky, you went to so many different competitions. Was it any different than uh, the other competition you went before? I mean, I, 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 tr I treated them kind of all the, the, similarly, but uh, you know, Tchaikovsky, of course, was the biggest one that I, that I ever did. And um, I really felt, uh, I felt the pressure toward the end, especially you know, with the live stream and everything and uh, everyone watching. But, uh, yeah. Uh, also, something I wanted to talk about that's interesting that uh, we met 35 years ago and we lived in the same dormitory. But well, we actually, really we formally met. Formally, but we never said really hello, met. but we saw each other in the corridors a lot. But when, when, when our friendship really started, when we New started York playing City. together, New we York. Were playing chamber music. Yeah, true. And we went with you also playing chamber music. Yeah. And it just happened that. Actually, you went to the Tchaikovsky competition right after our concert of the, of the trio. Right, right. So I, I think it's it's quite uh, quite uh, fortunate for musicians for us to have this opportunity to develop a, a friendship with somebody you don't really know playing music. It's just really unique opportunity. And uh, besides that, I think everyone should um, treasure the repertoire. But it's something which can in our case, last for so many years, we played in the trio, and every time we play, uh, piece we played 20 times, it's, it's different. And the beauty of this is that when, when you trust your partner, you don't really have to talk much about the music. You can just... <laughs> I mean, we talk besides playing, right? <laughs> and you're, you're in very you know, young, part of your career, and you're already a very experienced chamber music player. Were, were you introduced when you were really, really young? When did you start playing chamber music? Yeah, so I actually started playing chamber music when I was, I think, six or seven. It was, hmm. I had just barely started playing the cello, but I was um, playing a continual part in, I think it was uh, some Haydn, uh, no, I'm sorry, Handel, um, small ensemble uh, piece, uh, some arrangement. And uh, I remember one of the biggest lessons that I had, I, I think I was seven, it was one of our first concerts, and um, the two violinists, they both got lost, but in different ways. <laughs> and uh, I remember thinking in the moment, like, who do I follow? You know, like, who do I go with? And, and um, it, uh, it, was just, it was just funny, because it, it kind of, it, it, uh, you know, teaches you about the unpredictability of, of life and, you know, working with other people. But, uh, yeah, I think that um, uh, I learned probably more from doing chamber music than any other type of thing that I've done in my life. You know, just you learn so much from playing with, with people who are different than you are and seeing their perspectives. Absolutely, yeah. and sometimes you might not have something in common with the person you're playing, but the moment, and you might not even like the person, <laughs> but the moment you start working together, and especially going on the stage, something else happens. And there's a, there's a very beautiful moment of unity. Thanks for, for the music written for you know, all the instruments. Yes. And, uh, but it's, it's something I think uh, should be encouraged. And these days in, in the schools, everyone is required to play chamber music. But it's more than just a requirement. We, we have to, I think, pass this message that it's really one of the most crucial moments of, of development. In, uh, in the student years is to, to collaborate and play and learn from others and learn to react because it's not just knowing your part, it's listening to other instruments. And um, 
we were actually, in, in a sense, introduced to chamber music in very, very late in our career. We came to Newport Festival and forced yep. to play 20 pieces in, 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 <laughs> in one week or so. <laughs> so it was, it was a big challenge. With one year. Yes. But there was something I think we learned because we had to change our perception. But you know, Newport was nice because they would send you the score uh, one month before. Yes. So you would be ready for that hell. But otherwise, yeah. So. And, and in festivals I went, I was lucky. We had, I remember, we went once together, Texas El Paso Festival. Steve Crossman. Oh, yeah, Five rehearsals yeah. per piece, two hours. Piece was ready for broadcast. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah, it's yeah. They had that 27 days or 25 days and plenty of time and preparation, of course. But uh, Newport was different. The first time I played chamber piece, it was Schubert Quintet, and I was horrified. Because Moscow Conservatory Sonata is considered to be chamber music. <laughs> and that was uh, Gaidamovich studio, and whatever I played for her, I wasn't allowed to play for my professor because of the tension. But um, uh, yeah, Schubert Quintet, and I was so happy to discover beauty of it. And Louis Krasner was the coach in New England Conservatory. It was incredible. And then after that, I started to enjoy it much more. Yeah. Okay, thank you for this brief moment of uh, discussion. And so we have another cellist waiting to perform. Do you want to say a few words about this oh, sonata? Okay, yes, that's a sonata, solo sonata by Adam Khudoyan, written in 1961 for the first Tchaikovsky competition for cellos. Uh, fortunately, Adam wasn't a good politician and he dedicated Sonata not to Rastropovich, so it was out of the program. And I find that Sonata wonderful, and wherever I played it, people were really crazy about it. And uh, I, actually, I played it in Tchaikovsky competition too. It's a very nice piece, very nice piece. I will, yeah, unfortunately, he died, but uh, he kind of heard the recording, and then maybe because of that, he died. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, and we'll continue with thank you. Sandro Sidamanidze uh, is going to perform. Sidamanidze.
Bravo. Thank, thank you so much. That was a really fantastic performance. Really, really great. Powerful and exciting playing. Really fantastic. Um, so, I mean, I think you have such a great conception of the piece and you really own it as a performer. Um, so I, I don't have that much to say. Uh, I just thought maybe we could um, discuss a couple, couple things pertaining to sort of the shape of certain sections and um, also the, um, the sort of uh, approach that you would take with this kind of piece. And I wanted to just say, you know, so something interesting that I've been thinking about a lot lately uh, is that, you know, um, have you ever seen a, a magic show, like with a magician? Right, so you know when, when a magician goes on and they have a show, they have like, I don't know, how, however many tricks, right? But they also have a thousand more tricks, right, that they're not showing you, right? And I think that that's kind of the way that we need to think as, as players and as practicers, in the sense that every decision we make is like a trick. You know, we're the magician, right? But we're also leaving behind off stage all these other things that we also could have done, which we didn't, right? And so I think, um, and, then, and then what we do in the performance is we pick our best tricks, tricks, right? So we're able to do everything, but we choose what we want to do. And for me, that's the definition of virtuosity. It's, that's what it means to be a vir virtuoso. Um, so pertaining to this piece, because this piece is a virtuosic piece, right? Um, it's powerful and there's so much in it and different characters and qualities and, and it kind of gives the cellist the opportunity to show what they can do alone, just with their own instrument. Um, I think it's important to experiment with um, a, a lot of regularity in the pulse and then make the decision to not do it, right? But I would not just play freely without knowing what the difference is between, I don't think that this is what you were doing, but you know, I'm just saying in principle, you know, uh, it's, it's not a good thing to play freely without knowing why the freedom is there, why you need the freedom, right? Um, there were, I mean, overall I felt that you had a really great sense of the drive. There were a few places where I, I thought, you know, personally I would just question, um, Ultimately, you know, you might not end up changing anything, right? But it's important, you know, that I just want to prompt you with some questions about why you're doing certain things the way you are in the terms of the tempo. Like, one thing about the beginning is that, obviously, you have the tenutos, right? And that kind of makes you want to da, 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 da hold, hold back the tempo a little bit on those notes, um, which I think can work. But, you know, by the time you get to the place where there are tenutos on every note, like yum da da di da da di da, it's it's an interesting phenomenon because for me the music is saying there I want to become even more rhythmic like yum bum 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 bim bum bum, and like um, there, it's 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 easy to focus on kind of the on the the high notes, but actually ya da yum bum 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 bum, that's where the rhythmic drive is coming from. It's coming from the downbeats, right? Um, so, again, experimentation. If you can experiment playing that perfectly in rhythm, yada, yum, da, and feeling the normal hierarchy of the pulse in a 3 4 bar, right? So, actually, I'm just curious. Try once, just play like super straight, super straight. Um, and, and here's what I, I, I think we could try play just the first four lines super straight, and every time you feel like trapped by the fact that you're playing straight, just remember it, and at the end, you t we'll talk about all the places where you felt trapped. Nice, nice. So what do you feel? <laughs> right. I, what I felt as a, as a listener is that it had um, a certain effectiveness, but what it lacked was um, the sense of the, the uh, lacked impetuousness. It lacked the sense that there was something that was drawing you to a particular note, like a magnetism, you know. Um, so uh, this is actually something that I, I like to do in Bach as well. I think it's really important um, in terms of practicing the pulse.
So if you're like at 62 or 66, let's just say, let's say 68. Right, something like that tempo. You do one beat per bar, then you take it back to one, one beat every two bars, then every four bars. So you need a really good metronome that can go down to like 10. Right? Uh, in this case, um, my math is no good, even though both my parents are mathematicians. But uh, yeah, uh, you would go down to whatever it is, um, uh, 17, right, uh, for, for every four bars. And then what, what that will do is it will allow you to line up with the important structural moments, right? But uh, you still have a ton of freedom in between to really feel. Because again, I, I think it's, it's actually really interesting, you know, when he writes the Molto Rubato section, that the rubato is like, I remember someone told me once that rubato, you have to be a little bit like Robin Hood. You can steal, right? Because rubato means like robbed, right? Uh, you can steal, but you have to give back, back to someone, right? So if you take, you, what well, you take, you have to give. Um, and, um, and I think that that will really apply to this, even in the most rhythmic sections, yeah. Okay, so anyway, why don't we go, why don't we go on? It was fantastic, beginning. Why don't you just go... Uh, Excellent. I just have a quick question here. Sorry. Is the note, or is it? it yeah, yeah. It sounded, it sounded like, but it, make sure it's really the G sharp is a little lower because then, then, then you have the. Um, yeah, very good. You know what I was thinking while you were playing? It's fantastic. You have this figure, uh, the yada dum. Sometimes it can be, other times it can be a, uh, like for example, when you have, uh, if you want to re reestablish the sense of three, four, yada dum, da 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 yum. Right, so that's, that's an option. Uh, and when you get to the fortissimo, right there where we were talking about, it, there's no diminuendo. Right? Until actually the, the forte, which is dynamic lower. So I would keep sawing away. Also, that's a moment, I think, where the music has gotten very intense, so you could speed up a little bit. Yeah. You want to try that one more time? Uh, maybe just um, anywhere. Anywhere is fine. <laughs> Good. Yeah, and just be careful of for, uh, sfortando there, yeah. Uh, and it, also a cellerando, so I would... By here, I think it, it kind of, it's a little bit like jazz, actually. Imagine being a little bit of, of double bass, but you can really get quite fast. I think, so that the writ makes a lot of sense when you get there to the end. Uh, okay, you want to just try from the fortissimo? Faster. Now, writ. Yeah, nice. And it can be super dramatic, I think. Yeah, just pull back really a lot there as you crescendo. Beautiful. Nice. Excellent. Um, okay, let's go on. Actually, this section was really fine. It was beautiful. Um, again, with this, all this stuff, like starting here, kind of. All this, this stuff. I, uh, similarly to what we were saying in the Prokofiev about the writ, whenever you have a kind of rubato type of uh, musical idea, um, I still think it's very important that it can be followed. Because to the human ear, we, we, we are naturally drawn to something that has a sense of regularity. 
And even if the music is intentionally trying to, to play with the fact that it, you know, it's not, it's in 4-4, right? But it's doing all sorts of other things, making accents on the fourth beat or the second beat or whatever. Still, there's this sense that the, the, the pulse is continuing, that it's existing within a, a structure. It's like, um, you know, because I think we as humans, we love, we love rules. We love, that's why we love sports, right? Because so much can happen, but still there are rules, right? Um, and so for us, the rule is the, the inevitability of the pulse, and then we play around within that. I think that's what can create emotional power in the way that you phrase, the way that you do rubato. Why don't you try from here? And again, let's do the same experiment. Play super in tempo. Also, I would maybe play a little faster than you were, um, because it's very rhapsodic, and I think if you play a little faster than the ya da da, da it will make more sense. Yeah. Why don't you try like da? Very nice. Yeah, be careful that uh, you're not uh, rushing the triplets. In fact, if anything, I would draw out, draw out the triplets because it's kind of this, it's like chewing gum. Expand it. Very good. Uh, let's go on a little bit. Yeah, very, very good. And there also, I would count. I would also think about counting. Two, three, four, one, two, three. Uh, sorry, uh, this is the wrong note. But, um, but yeah, because the, the, it's the first time really in the piece that you've had that much silence, right? Um, that was really nice. So now, of course, once you play it really in tempo, it also gives you an opportunity to experiment with, with a little bit of a faster tempo, which I think could work also in general for the whole piece. Um, and then you find, okay, this note, I really need some time, or this triplet, I want a ya-da-da-da instead of ya-da-da-da, right? You can change the rhythm a bit because he writes rubato. But the point is, is that you have, you're doing your, your core tricks, right? And then you have the really nice ones that will really impress people. Uh, very nice. So it's actually same thing in the next section, the allegro. Uh, try once, like really in time. And the reason I think that this one actually should be a little more in time is because he writes the rubato afterward, right? So he clearly didn't want rubato here, right? <laughs> so try from him. Nice. Ah. Excellent. Uh, sorry, s same thing as before. The pizzicati, I would play much closer to the like, especially for the sforzandos. Right? Play in the rosin, really like, yeah, so much more powerful. It's fantastic. Uh, also the, um, this, powerful, I would say. Yeah, everything should be very, very powerful. Um, okay, sorry to stop you. Try one more time. This is really good. So it's interesting, when you play super in time, you realize that maybe the tempo you chose is not right, right? Because uh, it sounds, maybe it should be more like, uh, should something like that, right? So in that case, uh, it needs to be a little bit faster. So again, that, that, that's why it's so important to play in time first, because it teaches you so much about what the music needs at first, you know, teaches you where you need the time, where you need the, uh, the rubato. Um, okay, try one more time, maybe a little faster. Yeah, 
you're right, because there's no comma there, is there? Nice. Nice. Yeah, nice. Okay, very good. This is great. So now when you get here, I think you can do whatever you want. Now I think this is basically, the music is saying, now you can forget about the pulse and just do whatever it takes to play it well, to, to play it in a way that you like. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that you have this, uh, this figure, and then, if, and then later the tempo one, this thing. I would try to make a really big difference between the ya da da ye da 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 da, which is kind of intoxicated. And then by the time you get to the tempo one, I, I felt that it could have been more instantaneously in tempo, or risoluto. Um, okay, just try the rubato one more time. Nice. Excellent. Just had a couple of things. Um, this was really, really good. You know, this, this, the hard passage, right? I would recommend that you try to find a way to sing it to yourself, like yum, da, ta, da, 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 yum, ya, da, 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 da. This is the way I think, this is the way that I would hear it if, you know, someone were just playing on the piano, right? And then now your job is to figure out what it takes to play it that way on the cello. I know it's really hard, obviously. It's like so many shifts. But, um, I think the, the, the biggest thing to think about would be that in the quintuplets, you want to actually speed up toward the end. Da 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 da. I would think of them more as two plus three rather than three plus two, because then it will it'll feel more like like the rhythm the rhythm has the energy. Uh, that was great. Um, by the time you get to the the next page, yam bum but with all the downs, I would challenge yourself to think about sometimes you could have a little bit longer, more tenuto articulation instead of just kind of like the Quick retake, you know, dum ba ba da. I mean, of course, yeah, it is risoluto, so, but um, you have, can have variety there. Okay, this is all really good. I just want to talk a little bit about the adagio section because I felt that that was the one that, you know, it's the one in the piece that it's the hardest to pull off, actually, because there's, there's less happening obvi on, on the surface. Obviously, there's a lot happening underneath. Um, I think you had absolutely the right idea, being very free and kind of, you don't have to count as much in this whole section with the, it's, it's, it's very, I don't know, it's like you're, you're weaving a spell, right? You're, again, it's like, it's all magic. Um, but by the time you get to the top of the next page in the forte, I would think a lot about the pacing, particularly with the pulse, because you, you have this climax in the fortissimo that lasts quite a while. You need to find a way to really pick and choose what's important, what you want to lead to. Um, so why don't you start from here, the mezzo forte. By the way, at that point, I would start to get a little faster and a little bit more rhythmic. So you start counting more aggressively. And, ah, sorry, one other thing, not too loud, because it's only mezzo forte. You still have the fortissimo and the forte coming. Very, keep going. Yeah, just don't get slow in the long notes. No, keep counting. Two, three, 
two, three. Good. I think you had absolutely the right instinct doing a diminuendo there. Although in your music, it, there's no one written, there's not one written. I think you have to, because the music is just, it goes on in, in the same way for a certain amount of time. And, and it's really nice to, you know, to feel the difference between them. You can feel how each downbeat has like a different rhythm on it, a different character that will allow you to take one step further retreating into yourself. Um, Tenerimente was beautiful. Ah, you know, in the Tenerimente, actually, I would um, keep, keep counting, like really count very loudly inside, but then play extremely, you know, still, with, with a lot of stillness. Yeah. Um, great. So in the Allegro Giocoso, um, in the pizzicat pizzicato section, um, it was fantastic, very colorful. Something to think about. We often don't talk about pizzicato, but there's so many possibilities, like different fingers we can do, and also the difference between this. You could use all five of your fingers. So it's fun to experiment with, you know, like mix around between the thumb, the first, the second. Also, if you want something softer, try moving more dramatically, like. Um, I'm trying to remember, there was a there was a piece where, oh, like like for example, um, uh, in in the in the Britain Sonata, you can you can you can do that kind of thing where you phase in and out by uh, by moving up and up and down, and uh, that's, a, that's an interesting interesting thing to experiment with. Um, that was great, though. Um, ah, okay, so now the coda. I think it's really important in the coda. Of course, the music is very very. It's impatient. It wants to finish, right? But at the same time, I think you need to pick a tempo that you can manage to sustain in the hardest part at the end. Because I think there's a power, again, you don't have to actually end up doing this at the end, like, but I think you should be able to. And the reason is that there's a power to the regularity of a pulse as something is becoming more intense. If something can just continue being it feels really, really nice as, as a listener to, to be able to follow that rhythm, follow that pulse. So what would be like the fastest that you could play the, uh, uh, that passage? If you were just to take it on its own. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, nice, nice. Okay, that, that was pretty good. That was actually really good. Uh, I'd say the last line you lost me a little bit, mainly because if you can really, I mean, I know it's super hard, but if you can manage to find a way, also maybe try to preserve the slur. Uh, I don't even know what fingering you would do there. So maybe try going up sooner. Something like that. Um, it's, it's going to be hard anyway. But again, same thing. You want it to kind of just be this furious, this furious dash to the to the to the bar, double bar line, and then ideally yum bum 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 da yum. Of course, I know it's really hard. You could do a little bit of writ, but uh, again, it's just. I think this is something that you should think about. Even if you don't end up doing it, it's super important to be able to. Right? I think that that will help you achieve a new level of uh, mastery and appreciation for the piece overall. But, uh, um, okay, why don't you just play one more time so we can finish on a, on a high note. Yeah.
Fantastic. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're a very quick learner. <laughs> Do we have any questions for? Would you? Uh, maybe I can. Two questions. The first one's easy. When, do they come back and play this for you again so you can see how they worked in your suggestions? Uh, unfortunately, no. Yeah, because I'm just visiting. Um, I, I don't live here. So, but um, I mean, I, maybe at some point in, in the future, I'll hear these wonderful cellists again, uh, maybe in different repertoire. But uh, okay. Uh, and then that first group at the coda where you said, "Get your thumb all rosin." I don't know if my eye perception was off, but it looks like when you were doing it, you were going up, and when he was doing it, he was going down. Is it, does that make any difference? I mean, is it, which I would think you got to hit the certain string first. Uh, no, no, you're absolutely right. So I think he was he was doing uh, this kind of this where he's going to start from the top. Obviously, everything is very quick, so all four strings are going to resonate very in very close succession. But for me, first of all, the thumb is the strongest of the fingers for for pizzicato, so I like using the thumb. Uh, but also, if you start with the bass, and you get that low note, I think it's more powerful. And also, it's more natural for the hand to move down toward the rod. Whereas if you go this way, it's hard for us to move this way. So we end up actually going either kind of not really getting great contact, or it ends up being an awkward physical situation. But with this, you can kind of go diagonally almost. And you get the Nidrasa by the B string. So it doesn't really matter, it's just a preference, but you, because you didn't suggest he do it the other way. Yeah, well, I was thinking that the suggestion was in, implicit, but I, I personally do think that that is the better way for that particular passage, but there are other passages where going um, from the top down is doable. Yeah. Okay, and it seems like for each group, you know, they have one thing you're working on. You have to run all of them yourself, or you just happen to already know them, or what? Oh, well, they were playing, um, uh, like the Prokofiev is a is pretty standard piece, so I've played it before. Um, the the uh, Kudryan actually is not so well known, so I, I, I've never played it, I've never performed it, actually, but uh, it'd be really nice to hear it performed live. But all of these, these musicians have vast repertoires as well, so. Well, I assume they did, they should work on an instrument. It seems like you know how to play it too, so I think you have to prepare yourself also for each group that you're doing. Oh, a little bit, you know, I'll look, I'll look in advance and just kind of remind myself of what the piece is like. It's, okay, for Kofi, if I haven't played seriously in four years almost, so it's been a while. Um, uh, thank you very, very, very much. Uh, um, I, I especially was interested and appreciated your remarks about uh, dynamics. Um, the example that you gave of uh, the difference between mezzo forte and forte, uh, I thought was thrilling. Um, and, uh, uh, and I have a couple of questions about that generally. One, uh, what do you do when the dynamic markings are not in the score? Um, uh, and relatedly, what do you do if they are and you don't agree? Uh, and lastly, um, as a touring musician and soloist, how do you uh, make decisions about the acoustics of the hall that you're playing in? This one is very live, but others may be uh, much less so. How do you, and especially since you don't have much, ch much time, you arrive at the day of your recital. Uh, um, can you say a little bit about that, please? Yeah, absolutely. So, sorry, let me address your first question first. Um, um, thank you for your nice comment. Uh, in terms of you know, the di dynamics, the way I, I always see it is that the, the, mu the sheet music for us is like, um, it's like a treasure map, it's like clues, you know, but the music itself is what happens when we play. And it's just kind of like this, abs the notes are like this abstract kind of representation of what, you know, vaguely will happen. And uh, it's like a directive. And I feel like, uh, 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 being a good musician is about 
being able to read between the lines and understand what the music is telling you. Um, like, for, for example, the, the, a good example was in the Hudoyan right there, where, where uh, Hudoyan neglected, in my opinion, neglected to put the uh, diminuendo. He, he kept the passage fortissimo all the way until um, the, the, the harmonics. To me, that doesn't make sense with the way that he wrote it, because it, it would be, if, if it were all fortissimo, in my opinion, the peak, would, the, you know, the peak emotionally would have less meaning because it would be sustained in a way that is not proportional to my experience or his experience playing the piece through, right? The journey of the music. So I think that's, you know, that's a good example of where like you have to um, uh, sort of, you have to read a little bit in between the lines and guess a little bit because the, ultimately the essence of the music is not contained in the, in the dynamics. The dynamics are symptoms of the, this essence and great composers, they understand the essence of their own music, obviously. Um, and they will put dynamics that will make sense both to them and to the performer. Uh, um, so yeah, that's, I hope that answers your question about the dynamics. I know it's a kind of a complicated topic, but uh, uh, as far as the acoustics go, I think it's actually a little bit less of a problem for cello than it is for, for example, full orchestra. Um, just because there's, there's less going on, there, there's less that we can really change. You know, if we're in a really live acoustic, maybe we can relax a little bit and worry less about things like, um, you know, like for example, if you're playing Bach, often you worry about every note really speaking in a, in a very uh, concentrated way, the core of the sound. But um, if you're in a really live acoustic, sometimes if you play a little bit on the surface of the, of the string, the note will still resonate in a really nice way. So you don't have to be as, you don't have to micromanage it as much. Uh, I think when you play with piano, that's a little bit of a different story because obviously you have to calibrate the balance between the two instruments. But um, um, you know, if you have a sensitive pianist, they're also going to be making those adjustments, and it will work. So. Any more questions from the audience? Hi, thank you so much. Um, you have such an extensive background in chamber music, so I'm curious, what's been your favorite chamber music performance and why? That's a, that's a tough one. Um, wow. I've had some really, um, you know, there's, there are a couple that, that stand out. Like, I remember one time I was doing the, the Lalo string quartet, um, and it was just kind of, you know, a group of people, and. You know, for some reason there was just a really nice spark and, and everything came so easily to us as a group, the four of us. Sometimes you, you get really lucky like that and it's just the group is, is just magical from the beginning. Other times it's been like, oh, the piece that you played was like really meaningful. Like um, I remember I did once the uh, Shostakovich um, Opus 127, the, the seven uh, poems by Alexander Bloch. Uh, and I played it in a church um, and it's something about that moment was just very meaningful. But you know, it's it's like every every time you encounter you know different people, there's always a different energy, and it's uh, um, many of them are very very interesting. And of course, some of them are memorable in ways that aren't that great. Like I remember uh, <laughs> one time I was giving a performance. It was kind of like a, a larger ensemble, but we were playing this this modern piece, and uh, there was a violist sitting next to me, and we had. Uh, this, this really tricky rhythmic part where the, the tempo changed immediately and, and uh, we got to this moment, we had the exact same rhythm, it was like some sort of syncopation and he was not following the conductor at all so it ended up being like, uh, he was like twice as fast as me, we were completely off and I actually laughed on stage. It was, <laughs> it was kind of embarrassing, but, uh, but I, I was just because I'd been thinking about that moment throughout all the rehearsals that it was just gonna go wrong and it went so terribly wrong. So, you know, stuff like that is memorable too, obviously. <laughs> I have a question because I know that you're really incredibly quick learner. Is this something uh, comes natural for you or you develop some kind of approach? Because when we played a couple of times, Tchaikovsky trio and I think Aryansky trio. I think it's the first time you play it and it seems like you're very comfortable uh, from the first try. So have you developed some approach or it's uh, just as it comes for you natural? Oh, 
Uh, well, I think um, for me, the, the most important thing is I really enjoy listening to recordings. For me, I, I know a lot of people disagree with me that you, know, you shouldn't listen to recordings, you shouldn't be influenced. But uh, like all my free time I spend listening to interesting recordings, different performances of pieces, and like a piece that I'm learning, I'll try to, the very first thing I'll do is I'll listen to it because then I feel like I, um, again, going back to the thing about the dynamics, I feel like you know, just looking at the score is not enough for me because I'm not getting the essence of what the music actually is. You know, the music is, is live, it, it, uh, it has to exist. Um, and um, yeah, and then once I have that in my ear, then I have like a benchmark to which I can, I can strive to, to, to achieve, you know? And um, if I have the, the, that goal in my mind, I feel that it's much easier to, to know what I need to do to get there. Perhaps I have one more question because I know that Sandro is uh, he's preparing for YCA Young Concert Ar Artist auditions, and I know that they've been really helpful in your career in developing your concert engagements. Can you talk a little bit about this? Yeah, just about YCA. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, um, I, w I won the, the Young Concert Artist auditions in uh, November of 2017. And um, th for those of you who don't know, they're a really wonderful organization that, that specializes in um, uh, artist management for young, young musicians at the, beginning, uh, at the beginning of their careers. And um, it was like the first time I had experienced that kind of that world, uh, you know, where uh, relating to uh, an agent or a manager and, and then through them to presenters and um, having opportunities to travel um, more extensively for concerts. Um, and um, I, I think that, uh, you know, actually before the Tchaikovsky competition uh, in 2019, I gave, I think, somewhere, somewhere between eight and ten recitals uh, with the same program. And a lot of that music I ended up playing at the competition. And I really credit my comfort uh, in the competition with my sort of the fact that I had played those pieces so much in so many different settings. I felt really comfortable with them and it, and it made the competition feel like just another another performance of them, you know. So, um, yeah, they're a great, they're a great organization. Yes, yeah, the one of our organization is actually, there are a reason that uh, I came to this country because Susan Wadsworth, who was president for almost 60 years and uh, she was really very persistent in bringing me to this country, which I'm very thankful. And also she introduced me to Dorothy DeLay at Juliet, and then I came to, to work with Dorothy DeLay. And just to finish this session, I would like to say that uh, perhaps not everyone is aware that Dorothy DeLay was a graduate of Michigan State University in 1937. So we dedicate this series uh, to commemorate her memory and last year, we were fortunate to have so many former students, starting with Midori, Shlomo Mintz, uh, Perelman, Gil Shaham, and many, many others who did wonderful online sessions. And we're looking forward to Midori visits actually in October, in life, in person session, and many more to come. And um, I would like to thank uh, our production team uh, uh, for live stream, for preparation, Michael, Steve, and Jen. And also my special thanks, of course, to a wonderful person who really believes in, in many College of Music uh, projects, and he believes in the Doris Delay Music uh, Master Class Series. Uh, he's a professor of psychology, and he's here. Lauren Harris, thank you so much for your generous support. We all appreciate it very much. And of course, thank to wonderful cellist and uh, this uh, really amazing artist, exciting. Uh, Vladimir Fang for joining us today. Thank you so much. You. Hope to see you all on October 4th when Midori comes here. Thank you. <laughs>